Ah, you're back. Okay. Oh, big day, Sojiro, big day. Oh yeah, Yusuke's not on this chat, is he? We probably should invite him to this chat eventually. <laughs> That's going to be pretty useful uh, for um, the future. Oh yeah, we already had those. I did use a lot of attack items in the palace, and we have treasures to sell. I'm going to go ahead and get this. Since I have changed what I did today, uh, according to the guide, I'm going to be moving something else from the guide forward, and that would be crafting. Okay. So there's really not a whole lot else we can do in LeBlanc. And I've already got all three of the okay. gold chests in Madarame's palace, but I still like to be as ahead on lockpicks as possible. However, how many of these do I have? I'm not sure when the attack items are going to arrive. The thing is that having attack items is actually going to be really, really useful in yes. the upcoming boss fight. So, in fact, maybe instead of lockpicks, I'm going to go ahead and actually make some of these. Yeah. I guess having one of each of these is going to be helpful. Yeah. I'd ideally like more, but uh, trust me when I say these are really helpful in the Madarame boss fight, yes. in yeah. Royal at least. Not so much in the original game, but definitely in Royal. Well then. So this episode's gonna be a little bit weird because we've still got one day before we send the calling card of just doing confidants and daily life stuff. You ride this train at this time too. <laughs> What a coincidence. Don't you already know that? You confronted us earlier. From what I've heard in the comments, Yusuke's uh, train conversation earlier in the week actually changes based on when you reach the barrier. Uh, if you reached it before then, he'll actually talk about how Arn accepted his modeling invitation. We finished investigating the palace. All that's left is the calling card. When are you going to send it? And yeah, let's just do this first. So the more important it is, the more cautious we should be. You have a point. You are dependable, as I thought. I'll leave the timing of the calling card in your care. Me eat it whole. Oh, have you heard? Oh, she's not saying hi, everyone. So an interesting thing about Madarame is that some early kind of beta concepts show that he was supposed to be a western style painter rather than a Japanese style one. I like that they changed it to Japanese style for reasons that I'll get to soon. Yeah, Synesthesia is something that is gone into one of the levels in Psychonauts 2, which is one of the most popular levels in that game. It's a really, really creative concept for a level, I will admit, and it also involves Jack Black. Um, yeah. But anyway, class question. Um... <laughs> so the root of this word actually is Greek, it's not like one of those words that the guy in My Big Fat Greek Wedding thinks the root of is Greek. So yeah, sin in this case would be together. little like aesthetics so in this case yeah senses I do like how a lot of um a lot of you know European languages you can kind of figure out the general like idea of what words are related to each other by which ones are similar so in this case the full word would be senses coming together nice. this is it good not really sure we're gonna be having a snack because I know where we're going after this and it's oh, it's a little weird Yeah, I did have a book when I was younger called Born on a Blue Day about someone who um, saw, you know, days as colours. 
Nice going. Wasn't there that person who painted Pi as a landscape? I see. Yeah, Madarame isn't a super genius at all, he just rips off people. Rips off young people specifically. So, yeah, originally I was going to be all like, oh, hey, uh, we can do Ryuji's confidant today, right? Well, it turns out actually no, because once you reach a palace's treasure, you can't hang out with any um, party member confidants until you send the calling card. So, I could go to Maruki and get ahead on him, but I actually thought, okay, here's the idea that I came up with, and I really hope this works. I'm going to see Takemi today. And then swap when we see Ryuji next with when we would have seen Takemi next in the guy. And I hope that works. The one thing I do want to do is, so I don't forget later, I need to return my previous book and withdraw a new one. The next book that I need to withdraw is The Gallant Robe. But yeah, this was hinted at by a walking to school conversation earlier. But from now on, we no longer get an increase in guts from studying in the library, but we can also hone knowledge more efficiently now. More efficiency now, like? duh, duh, duh. Anyway, yeah, I need to return a book. Returning the Thank Alluring you. Dancer. What would you like? And yes, as I said, we need to get the Gallant Rogue, which, yeah, conveniently is available to rent after Yusuke joins the party. Here. Honestly, I really, really don't think anybody's going to miss Shujin. I'm pretty sure that like all the social media posts from people graduating Shujin can be summed up as I'M FREE! I'M FREE! I'M FREE! Uh, hey, you have something to say. Yeah, he's alluding to the fact they give debuffs, but they can also give some healing. No, I don't have enough guts to talk about the bag. I want to make a... Well, actually, you'll be the one making a purchase, because okay. I want to sell all of my Madarame treasure. Be grateful. And that's because very soon we're going to actually be needing a lot of money. Okay, I need again. to be a lot more stingy with my cash from now on. Basically, we're going to be starting a confidant soon that requires you to spend money every time you see them. And obviously, that's going to be kind of uh, awkward. What can I get you? Okay, that's new. Well, I suppose I can buy that. <laughs> Just when I was saying I had to be more stingy with money. I'm not sure if a lot of art galleries really allow dogs. I mean, unless they're guide dogs. Hello, old people. What gossip do you have today? You know, I can honestly agree. Oh, that's really ominous. <laughs> you may need new glasses, just saying. That is actually a hint towards something that we can't fully do just yet, though. Okay, so hopefully we can so hang annoying. out. Yep, Matador. Please head to the exam room. So this is off script, but it will actually be giving us access to um <sighs> SP adhesive since this will be rank five. This is honestly a lot uh nicer than you usually act, letting us go straight home. Hello. Seems like we didn't get knocked out particularly badly that time either. Is that the teriyaki chicken calling again? <sighs> yep, 
You know, from everything we've heard of Oyamata, this is probably a good thing. Hmm. You know, maybe you just need to have more confidence in yourself. Really? As I've said before, Takemi is very similar to Joker. It's just she gets one blemish on her record and then everyone shuns her. But we're finding out more about that incident now. Yeah, I had a feeling he was the culprit. <sighs> uh, so it wasn't even a legitimate error, you were just framed for it. That's even more like Joker. Yet that guy is still in charge of a major hospital, and you're left just at a rundown clinic nobody cares about. That's fine, I guess. I mean, the freedom's kind of nice. But yeah, I could kind of tell where this is going. I mean, if we don't have it, this should be harmless, right? Oh, exactly what she's saying. And here the options actually do give points, so that's good is the best one. <laughs> and sparkles already. Hey. This late, huh? Well, why do I get the feeling we're only halfway into the game? Well, this confidant at least, we're nowhere near halfway into the game itself. Medicine has a special price, a special very, very, very high price. It's worth it, but it's a very high price for now. We'll get cheaper a little later into the Confidant, though. All right. Though I don't think we'll actually be able to come and buy your stuff until mm. tomorrow, but we're sending the calling card tomorrow. Nuisance. It's just a patient who really likes coming here and thinks you're a good doctor. Yeah, I just feel like her whole situation with being blacklisted has just given her a major, I mean, I don't know if this is technically like imposter syndrome, but she doesn't seem Bye. to even really be able to comprehend the idea that people might think she's a good doctor. Yeah, I admit that hits a little close to home sometimes. Well, we were probably bound to find out eventually, and I think she was ready to tell. And here it's, yeah, about Miwa-chan. First person, huh? Maybe she'll be able to shed that name and become known as the doctor who cured that disease. Ah, you're back. Aha! Hey. The package did come. Also, Yo. as much as I really would like to see Yoshida, hey. I'd rather not get too off script in the guide yet. Three blowtorch, three dry ice, three magneto oh. coil. Ah, oh, those might actually be multi-target items, and if they are, that could be a problem. But let's check the TV. Wait, it's the time of year when young people wearing suits come out in droves? This game predicted that weird Minions meme! I have no idea what that is. Like, it's just, I'm so confused. I'm so confused. It's like a generation below me, and I'm extremely confused. I and mean, I did see bits of the first Despicable Me on TV, and I thought it was alright, but like... 
that meme, wow, I'm... It, it uh, yeah, it very much confuses me. So, you got that? yeah, tonight... Tonight, we were supposed to do crafting, which I moved to last night. Is the bathhouse... Okay, I can slightly boost charm do? here. So I could kind of do that to sort of get back on track with the charm boosts. Yeah, I haven't talked to these kids yet. Oh no, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get, like, not caught up with that. <laughs> I felt that guy's like, hell, like, if you see a kid saying, oh, you should watch that kitty stuff, it's lame. You know that they just have an entire room full of Featherman memorabilia secretly. Hmm? But yeah, show definitely has history. I mean, it has been in the series okay. since Persona 2. I think tonight I'm just going to play it safe and go for an increase in charm at the bathhouse. But, because this has just been a part covering one day, I'm going to be doing something else in this episode. I promised that I'd talk about DLC personas eventually. And now we've unlocked both itemization and traits, I think now is the perfect time. There's still one aspect of DLC personas that I can't discuss yet, uh, like in full detail, but it'll all make sense at the end of the third palace. You have These are the paths you so have DLC won. personas, when you have them, will appear in the compendium. You can summon them from the compendium for the first time for this free. Persona? Every other time will require you to pay for them. Also, once you have a DLC persona um, downloaded, then you will be able to fuse it just like a normal persona. Not terrible. But not impressive. Oh, you have no idea. Those are the wrongest words possible to describe Kaguya. Even though you confuse these normally, I'm not going to be doing that for this playthrough. And also note that they do not count towards compendium completion. And now, let's go over all of the DLC personas. With one royal exclusive exception, all DLC personas come in sets of two. The regular version and the Picaro version. Picaro is Spanish for rogue or rascal and refers to the picaresque genre of phantom thief stories. But in Japanese it's interestingly written with the kanji meaning thief god. In gameplay though, they're just recolors, usually with higher level than the original and slightly different learn sets. Also, the regular Persona will always itemize into a piece of armor or accessory, while the Picaro Persona always itemizes into a skill card. I'll now be covering the vanilla Persona 5 DLC Personas in level order. Ironically, the lowest level one, Kaguya the Moon Princess from Persona 4, happens to be the most busted of the vanilla DLC Personas. So Kaguya has a pretty solid magic stat for her level, and has some pretty good immunities, a weakness to fire, but that can be covered with skills. Her unique trait is Inviolable Beauty. The in-game description of this is a little misleading. It says there that it triples counter damage, but it actually applies to all reflected damage, which means that Repel Physical will be doing triple damage all the time. While I haven't tested this, I would assume this also applies to Tetrakan and Makarakan. She's not going to have all the bouncing fun herself though, that sounds kind of weird. She itemizes into a piece of armor that's exclusive to females and gives repel physical high. If only there was a female joker option, that way this would also get tripled by inviolable beauty. Speaking of repelling things, the main elephant in the room here is that Kaguya learns Repel Physical at only level 22, which is absolutely disgusting. But that's not the only way Kaguya is broken, because she also gets Medea Rama way earlier than you're supposed to have access to it, and Divine Grace, which makes Medea Rama pretty much full healing. And if you want actual full healing, she learns Diarahan at level 21. 
But would you believe that's also not the most broken thing about her? Because her signature skill, I've listed this in red, which means it cannot be passed down to any other persona, but why would you want to? Shining Arrows is light bless damage to all foes from 4 to 8 hits. If you are aware of the infamously broken persona Yoshitsune, this is essentially the closest thing to a magical counterpart of his infamously broken signature skill Hustle Tobi. If you can get Bless Boost and Bless Amp onto Kakuya and Concentrate, the damage output from this is downright insane. Kaguya Picaro is not a huge upgrade, all she does is swap Counter-Strike for High Counter, which is pointless since she learns Repel Fizz anyway. But getting Repel Physical almost 10 levels higher than her base form is actually not great. The main reason you want Kaguya Picaro is during an alarm, which is a mechanic we'll get to later, she itemizes into the Medea Rahan skill card. Getting this at level 25 is pretty ridiculously busted, especially since by that point, you'll likely have unlocked the ability to duplicate skill cards too. Overall, just the base form of Kaguya alone is incredibly broken, so I would recommend not using her if you want any challenge in the early game. Japanese progenitor god Izanagi and starting persona of Yu Narukami in Persona 4 is the second DLC persona we'll be covering. His main asset is his unique trait, Godmaker. This says it raises the chance of allies' traits activating. According to some research people have done online, it actually triples their chances. So Ryuji's Raging Temper is normally a 20% activation rate, it's 60% with Izanagi equipped, which is incredibly powerful early on. You'll also have 60% chances of Arn reducing SP costs. Yusuke, I'm not even sure how this interacts with Yusuke, honestly. If it really does triple it, that would make your party almost immune to physical attacks as long as Yusuke is present. He itemizes into an accessory that gives Life Surge, increasing max HP by 30%. There's an accessory you can get with this in town, but it's incredibly expensive. His exclusive skill is Cross Slash, which is two hits of heavy physical damage to one foe with high accuracy. I've not used this myself, but I'd assume this is incredibly powerful for the early game. Other than that, he has balanced stats all round, a weakness to wind, but an immunity to curse is pretty nice. The main thing you want to use him for is Godmaker though. His Picaro form swaps Tarukaja for Rakukaja, but most notably also swaps Dodge Fizz for Null Fizz. Of course, if you have Kakuya, this is outclassed by Repel Fizz, but having Null Physical at only level 25 is not bad. I wonder if this is a reference to how easy it is to get Null Physical early in Persona 4 via Magician Shuffle Time. He itemizes into the skill card for Growth 2, or Growth 3 during an alarm. Growth 3 lets a persona gain 100% experience while it's inactive, so this is great for training up personas that you don't want to have equipped at the moment. And if you can replicate this skill card, there's nothing stopping you from giving it to all your personas. Not as broken as Kakia, but Godmaker is still an amazing trait. Next we have the tragic Greek poet Orpheus and starting persona of the protagonist of Persona 3. His unique trait is Circle of Sadness, which gives Joker 4 auto revives with 1 HP per battle. With this, you're pretty much never going to have Joker die, and it goes some way to mitigating that weakness to Curse, as it means that you're weak to mood or instant death skills. He itemizes into the Hades Harp, which gives a slight agility boost, doubled thanks to the glitch, remember, and also Null Brainwash, which is an especially good status to nullify. Now I will say though, there is a way to get Null Brainwash accessories without DLC. But it comes a little later in the game, so this can be good to get if you want to go for DLC early. Orpheus brings back his unique skill Cadenza from Persona 3, except this time it's no longer a fusion spell requiring Apsaras. It restores 50% of the party's HP and also acts as a Master Kukaja. Overall pretty solid, the main thing holding it back is that Royal added a different variant of Orpheus as DLC, and it came with an even more busted version of Cadenza. 
But still, if you don't want to use the Royal DLC, which is paid in the PS4 version, this is the next best thing. Other than that, Mara Kakajra at level 30 isn't bad, but Orpheus doesn't have great stats or skills overall. I'm actually not sure if Endure stacks with Circle of Sadness, but if it does, that's 5 Order Revive, which is kind of silly. His Picaro form learns some much more significant skills though. Swapping Maraku Kaja for Mataru Kaja, and level 33 is quite low for that skill. Mataru Unda is also pretty solid to have, and Agidine in the 30s is also a pretty early point to have a heavy tier magic spell, especially with fire boost. Speaking of heavy tier fire skills, that's what he itemizes into, the skill card for Agidine or Maragidine. And at the point you can get it, a Maragidine skill card is kind of stupidly powerful. So, Orpheus may not be as obviously broken as, say, Kakia, but then again, what is? He's still a pretty solid DLC option. Daughter of the King of Crete in Greek mythology, and the one who gave Theseus the ball of yarn he used to navigate his way through the Minotaur's labyrinth, Ariadne is one of my favourite DLC personas because She's from Persona 4 Arena, making this one of her few appearances in an RPG Persona game. She's also one of the ones with a busted trait, Tag Team. When you baton pass from someone else to Joker, and Joker uses an item with Ariadne equipped, that item is not consumed. This is most useful once you have access to Somas, which are a full HP and SP heal on the entire party. Effectively, this gives you infinite Somas, which is completely busted. Provided you can knock down an enemy and get a one more. She itemizes into the Red String, which gives Auto Tarukaja to the bearer and a really big boost to luck, even more so with the stat doubling glitch. This is great for critical hit based builds, although you may want to note that critical hit rate is capped at 60% in Royal. Her unique skill is Beast Weaver, and unique is right. This inflicts colossal physical damage to one foe. In fact, it is the single strongest physical skill in the entire game. But it comes with a caveat. After you use it, Joker's attack is permanently lowered for the rest of the battle. And this is not a debuff. It's a permanent modifier that stacks with debuffs. So this attack reminds me of Overheat or Draco Meteor in Pokemon, except you can't negate it with a white herb. Ariadne also learns some other pretty solid skills. Apt Pupil combined with Miracle Punch means Miracle Punch will nearly always crit. Fortified Moxie to raise critical rate even further while ambushing, which you will be doing almost all the time. And Evade Fizz is kind of solid, though it's no repel physical. She also learns Charge fairly early. Ariadne Picaro comes at a significantly higher level than her base self, though this doesn't matter when you can summon her from the Compendium once for free. And she has a higher strength stat, swaps out Fortified Moxie for Heat Up, which can be nice for emergency SP restoration, but most notably, swaps Attack Master for Auto Mataru. Ariadne Picaro is in fact the earliest source of Auto Mataru in the game, and that is an incredible skill. This is also the skill card she itemizes into, and you don't even need an alarm for it. That's basically the main reason you want Ariadne Picaro, but it's a very, very, very good reason. Auto Mataru is amazing. Izanagi, after failing to save his wife from the underworld and being stained in its filth and gore, Magatsu Izanagi. His unique trait is Hollow Jester, which is situational, but in those situations is one of the best things in the game. It boosts damage by 40% for every enemy in the battle that has an ailment, and this stacks, by the way. Against bosses and single targets, it's usually not that good, especially if they're immune to ailments. But in mob fights against large numbers of enemies, especially combined with his exclusive skill, Magatsu Mandala, medium curse damage and a chance of confuse, fear or despair to all enemies, I have seen people deal some of the highest damage possible in this game through Hollow Jester. But it may not even be necessary if all the enemies get inflicted with fear, because you can use Ghastly Whale to instantly kill them. 
He later learns Bloodbath for even more chances to inflict ailments, and Heat Riser to buff all the stats of one ally. This is the earliest source of Heat Riser in the game, however I will say Heat Riser is not as useful in Royal, as there's kind of a full party version that has a drawback that can also be negated, and there's a later party member who can randomly give you a free Heat Riser, so not actually as useful as you might think, but it's still a decent skill. Oh, I forgot to talk about his itemization item. It's actually not bad, and it's the pretty much reverse of Izanagi's, giving a boost to strength and increasing max SP by 30% instead of HP. More SP is always good to have, so this isn't a bad item. His Piccaro variant is mostly notable for having the longest name of any persona in the game, to the point where the compendium just calls him M. Izanagi Piccaro. Other than that, he's actually not that much of an upgrade, he just swaps out Mazeodyne for Magarudyne and Attack Master for Speed Master. Really, the only reason you want him is because he itemizes into the skill card for either Heat Riser or Debilitate. Debilitate, unlike Heat Riser, is an incredibly useful skill to have, though there are non-DLC ways to get its skill card. It lowers all stats of one target, by the way, which makes it an excellent anti-boss move. And something I actually just noticed here, in the original Persona 4, Magatsu Izanaki had no weaknesses, but here he's gained a weakness to Nuke, an element that was not in that game. Often forgotten sibling of Amaterasu and Suzanoo, Tsukiyomi also debuted in the Persona 4 Arena games, and this, I believe, marks his debut in an RPG, unless he was in Persona Q1. I don't think he was. His trait is Bolstering Force, which boosts damage by 50% during a one more. Since many bosses don't have weaknesses and are immune to crits, this isn't useful where it really matters. But in regular fights, he can help out sometimes. He itemizes into the Black Moon item, which gives the Apt Pupil skill, which raises critical rates. Also boosts strength by a good deal, making it a pretty good accessory for physical attackers like Ryuji and Yusuke. Thing is though, there is a way to get apt pupil accessories without DLC, though it does require doing well at the batting cages, so um, if you want to um, pay to win to skip that, I wouldn't blame you. His unique skill is fairly boring, just severe curse damage to all foes, but he does naturally learn Drain Curse, which can be passed down to other personas, and Curse Amp to boost your curse damage. I don't know why he gets Life Drain though, that's a really pathetic skill at this high of a level. The most notable thing about Tsukiyomi is Arms Master, which halves the HP cost of physical skills. Great ability overall, and one that you definitely want to spread around to other physical personas if you have the chance. The Piccaro version swaps Life Drain for Spirit Drain, which I consider to be better, and also swaps Arms Master for Spell Master, halving SP costs of magic. And you can spread that around through his itemization, which gives the Spell Master and Arms Master skill cards. These are really great skills that you pretty much want on all of your endgame personas, so Sugiyomi is obviously a very good choice just for that alone. Kinda sad that so many of these Picaro personas just end up as electric chair fodder. We saw the one who helped defeat the Minotaur, now it's time to meet the actual Minotaur of Crete himself, Asterius, and wow is his official art awesome. I just felt the need to point that out. But as an actual persona, he has very good stats in both strength and magic, as well as the frenzied bull trait. Now this in the game says it raises damage when low on health, and I originally thought this would relate to the percentage of health you lost, and maybe would think of giving him Endure to make a setup like that. I looked around online, and the general consensus is, this is a lot simpler. It just doubles all of your damage when you're below 50% HP. It's essentially Izanagi no Okami's infamous trait, except it doesn't rely on the compendium percentage, but you also have to be below half health, so it's a lot more risky. Still, if you can find a setup to get to half health, especially since you can lower your own HP with physical attacks, this can result in some very high damage. He itemizes into the Blazing Horns and Inferno Horns, which give a massive endurance boost as well as Fire Amp. 
His exclusive skill is Titanomachia. In most other SMT games, this is a physical attack, but here it's a severe fire attack to all foes, with a high chance of fear. Interesting, and he also gets fire amp to boost it. Auto Mataru is as fantastic as always, but since other DLC personas get this earlier, it's not hugely notable. He also gets Tetracon, but by level 60 you'll probably have already got that on earlier personas. He is the lowest level persona to learn Gigantomachia though, for what that's worth. His Picaro form swaps Auto Mataru for Auto Masuku and Tetracon for Makarakan. Other than that, not a huge change, except his skill cards are Gigantomachia and Agniastra, both pretty good physical skills. The Greek God of Death, who I honestly wish was not so iconic to Persona 3 so he could be a non-DLC Persona in later games, but anyway, it's Thanatos. The extra H is short for... not actually Iron Heart, because of all the DLC Persona traits, I consider this one of the worst ones. And even more so for the fact that there's actually a different trait that Thanatos really, really wants. An ultimate persona available in the base game has the trait Omen, which multiplies the success rate of instant death skills by 1.5. Not only can this be passed to Thanatos, but it also will buff the instant death chance of his signature move, Door of Hades. Door of Hades is a very interesting skill, because looking it up online, it turns out that while the damage is almighty type, the instant death chance is actually curse element, meaning it won't work on enemies immune to curse, but will succeed more often against enemies that are weak to curse. Because of this you don't really need Mahmuda on, Door of Hades is basically the same thing except it also does damage if the enemy is immune to death, kind of like Beelzebub's death flies in Shin Megami Tensei I just realised. But Curse Ant Maega on is nice, as well as One Shot Kill, one of the highest critical rates of any skill, and the strongest gun attack in the game. And Enduring Soul is also a very solid ability, it's Endure but a full heal instead of just 1 HP. His itemization is a callback to his heart item from Persona 3, the Ring of Darkness. It just gives Evade Curse, which I don't consider to be that great. In fact, didn't the original Ring of Darkness outright Null Dark? So it's kind of a downgrade, but at least it gives a bit of a magic increase. Thanatos Picaro I find one of the cooler looking Picaro Personas, and he learns Mudo Boost instead of Curse Amp. Logically this would affect the instant death rate of Door of Hades, so that sounds like a useful skill to have. Not so useful is swapping Fortified Moxie for Adverse Resolve, which requires you to be ambushed in order to work. His skill cards are interesting though. Maegon is heavy curse damage to all enemies, but Demonic Decree is a curse based skill that halves one enemy's HP. Overall, it's one of the more unique skills in the game, but I don't really find it that useful since most things you'd want to use it on are weak to instant death curse anyway, and well, we've also got Door of Hades. But hey, at least the skill has novelty value. Thanatos being resistant to physical is also pretty nice. Officially representing messiah myths across the world, but in a lot of ways being heavily based on one in particular, it's Messiah, the highest level DLC persona in the vanilla game. His trait is Hallowed Spirit, which doubles the amount of HP and SP restored to yourself. This works well with the Regenerate 3 and Invigorate 3 that he learns, and if you really want to make the best use out of it, you can also pass down the Regenerate 1, 2 and Invigorate 1 and 2 skills. This is actually just an objectively better version of two ultimate persona traits from the base game. And speaking of base ultimate personas, it's a trait that if you can somehow get it onto the ultimate persona of the Faith Arcana in Royal, well I'll cover that once we get to the ultimate Faith persona which is going to be way later, but trust me it's worth it. He itemized into Serious Armor, one of his many heart items back in Persona 3, which gives a very good amount of defense, some avoid, and reduces magic damage passively, and is also unisex. He also comes with solid all-round stats, a lot of resistances, unfortunately a curse weakness, but that's very easy to cover once you're in the level 80s. Learns Enduring Soul and Drain Physical, 
he makes for one of the better tank personas in the game. Even more so, as since Persona 3, he's gained a new signature move, Oratorio, which refers to a form of religious opera. As a bit of random trivia, Monty Python actually made an oratorio adaptation of Life of Brian, which is apparently the only comedic oratorio in existence. Anyway, it's a full heal to all allies and removes their debuffs. Finally, a very notable thing about Messiah's skill set is Almighty Boost. Messiah and a Royal Exclusive DLC persona are the only two to learn this naturally, and it's otherwise only available randomly via Network Fusion. This skill is highly sought after on certain endgame builds, and Messiah is the most convenient way to access it. Unfortunately, Almighty Amp is still exclusive to random Network Fusion. And now I suppose it's time for the not the messiah, but a very naughty boy version, Messiah Picaro. And does anyone else think that looks like a Warhammer 40,000 Iron Halo? He swaps out Regenerate 3 for Insta Heal, Invigorate 3 for Life Aid, and Drain Fears for Firm Stance. Firm Stance is one of my favourite skills for the late game, so it's nice to have that, but... Here you miss out on those gradual recovery skills that benefit from Hallowed Spirit, and also Fizz Drain, so I prefer the regular version of Messiah. Especially since you can just itemize him during an alarm to get the Firm Stance skill card and give that to regular Messiah, and have the best of both worlds. So, sorry Messiah Picaro, you look incredibly cool, but I'd rather have the regular version of you. And so, that's all the DLC Personas in the vanilla version of Persona 5, all of which are free in any version of Royal. I hope this video has helped you decide whether or not to use these in your playthroughs. But I'm sure most of you are looking forward to the Royal DLC Personas because many of them are even more disgustingly broken. I'll go over those at a later date, since in the PS4 version you have to pay for them. In my playthrough though, I don't think I'll be using any of these, I just feel the base game wasn't balanced with them being free in mind. But all the more power to you if you decide to use them yourself. So with this I should be pretty much back on sync with the guide in terms of charm, hopefully. So really the only way I'm out of sync is on Chariot, but I'm one ahead on Death, so... As I said at the very start of this playthrough, hey. you don't need to worry too much about guides in this game. There's a lot of room for freedom and improvisation. But we have a train day today, so uh, according to the guide, we're going to be reading Buchiko's story, which raises kindness. This is a reference to the story of Hachiko, who supposedly kept going to the same train station and waiting for his master, even though his master had passed away. It's also referenced in The World Ends With You. Basically, any Japanese work set in uh, Shibuya will reference this. But now that we're back on schedule, it's time. Let's begin. After this. Oh, actually, wait, no, this is important. Okay, I'm glad this happened because I forgot to talk about this. It's actually relevant to what we're doing today. So we're basically participating in Clean Up uh, Tokyo Day. Yeah, I had a day uh, in my primary school called Clean Up Australia Day, so this just reminds me of that. Yay, we're all going on a school excursion to the park to pick up people's rubbish. will take place on the 30th. Let me guess, Ryuji's uh, calling to complain? Yep. <laughs> Yet another reason why the principal is a jerk. <laughs> Scandled up the school's rep. I love when people invent new verbs. Yeah, Humpty Dumpty's pretty much going crazy over the whole Kamoshita thing right now. I mean, yeah, but we really don't want another Kamoshita situation to happen.
Yeah, no, I think he's pretty decent. It's open. Oh, and we have Ryuji's counseling session today too. What's up? Hey there. Hmm. Man, it would feel pretty weird to do this in this very medical looking room. Ah, uh, yeah, the whole problem kid reputation. <sighs> and I mean, admittedly, he's new to Shujin, so he doesn't have uh, any knowledge of that stigma. Well... Uh, I can tell Ryuji's facial expression re relaxed a lot there. How about it? Uh... <laughs> Ryuji and Arn ship as disappointed. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you're probably not supposed to talk about that kind of thing with him. I'm sorry. Yeah, hang out with buds inside people's minds. Let's not tell him the second half of that sentence. Yeah, so he probably had to read his records and see that. Hmm. Quite. So yeah, uh, the art book actually has has uh, described like how fast Ryuji could run back when he was still active, and it's actually pretty fast for a teenager. <sighs> Way more important stuff now, huh? As Maruki's saying. <laughs> Well, as long as Ryuji doesn't explain exactly what that very important stuff is. Y yeah. I mean, he still has some good experiences from the whole track team thing. I know. What the hell? <laughs> that voice clip, I think, was quite well timed. I mean, like, I kind of get what he was saying, but at the same time, you really don't want to go into the secrets territory. There was a satirical show that I watched ages ago that covered this thing. I think it actually originated in Australia, which is a little embarrassing, but it's this weird quasi-religious thing where um, it's basically like, wish hard enough or something, and the universe will distort itself to make that happen. I think some pretty high-profile US actors actually got into it too. I mean, I could go for a free apple juice coupon <laughs> right about now. Uh, yeah. It's a weird thing to be saying to someone, but then again, we in this uh, world hang out with a lot of people who can be described that way. Now, I suppose Ryuji doesn't really like people who are normal. <laughs> so that session kind of went some awkward places, but it ended decently well. The thing that I was going to cover though is we, if we check the calendar now, 
On the 30th it says school cleanup event. The thing to know about this is, the game will actually not let you send the calling card on this date. In fact, I don't think it will let you send it here either. Basically, the 30th, there is a plot event then that has to occur on that date. Uh, and you cannot go to the palace or send the calling card then. So remember that when you're planning out for the deadline, you need to make sure to send the calling card on any day that is not the 30th. But that's not going to be a problem because we're going to send the calling card today. See you next time as we steal Matarame's treasure.